Something that you may not know is that he did his uh, uh, PhD on deep networks for speech recognition uh, in uh, 1991, uh, and uh, says that they still work pretty well. Uh, uh, but they, we, uh, he and uh, his uh, students have learned lots of new ways to train things that make them work even better. It doesn't hurt that the computers are a lot faster as well. Uh, when he was doing his PhD, I was an undergraduate, and that was the uh, second time uh, that neural networks were hot. And so I was very interested in them and uh, you know, taking neural network courses and so forth. This is the time when Paul Spolensky was doing neural networks, when Michael Jordan was doing neural networks. Uh, in fact, uh, he also did his uh, postdoc with Michael Jordan at MIT after that. Uh, and then was at uh, uh, AT&T before, uh, before uh, ending up at uh, Montreal. Uh, so he has uh, uh, Canada Research Chair and uh, lots of awards and uh, uh, is on the editorial boards of lots of journals and has been uh, Program Chair and General Chair of NIPS. Uh, and he, I would say that uh, together with uh, Jeff Hinton and uh, Yann Lacan, he's one of the people who have really brought uh, neural networks uh, back in this third resurgence. Uh, of excitement uh, when they're actually being picked up by all kinds of areas of engineering and Google is building is buying uh, neural network companies for uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so we're looking forward to what he has to say, which uh, combines uh, two of his uh, abiding interests over the years, uh, namely uh, how to use uh, um, the tension between generative and discriminative modeling uh, and, uh, uh, and networks. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. And thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, so I have only less than an hour, so I'll, I'll skim through a few things. Uh, and please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me in the middle and ask questions. Uh, I much prefer that. So let me start with some uh, general notions. Um, tell you a little bit about some of the motivations for what we're doing. Jan, Luca, and I created this conference called International Conference on Learning Representations. And we think that learning representation is one of the uh, really important aspects of machine learning that has been overlooked uh, until recently, and that uh, there are lots of advantages for doing that. And this slide will illustrate uh, one of the early ideas that uh, as we know, when we're using machine learning in applications, uh, the results we're going to get are very strongly dependent on the kinds of features you use as input. And so it would be great if we have uh, machine learning methods that you know, find the features for us. And this, that's one way to think about what representation learning is. But it's actually much more than that. Um, as the second part of the slide shows, it's also about making sense of the data and trying to figure out how the data came about and what are the underlying generative factors and causes that could have uh, uh, produced the data. So good representations have to do with uh, good guesses at what are the underlying causes and factors. And these two things are related. Uh, this is traditionally sort of the, the, the scribbling supervised learning kind of framework. And uh, when we think about learning representations, so you can, uh, we can also think of learning them in an unsupervised way using, for example, generative models. And the second half of my talk will be about that. Having good representations makes a lot of sense uh, in many cases. And there's an example that uh, you, you probably use uh, without knowing. And that is uh, Google image search, where uh, you combine representations for queries, which are sequence, short sequences of words, with representations for images two representations live in the same space, like a 100-dimensional vector. And uh, you, you simultaneously, simultaneously learn representations for the words and representations for images, such that uh, representation for an image and comes close to representation, of, to, uh, representation of, of a keyword that is associated to the image in the logs of um, uh, people clicking on, on images after typing a query. By the way, this is mostly the work of my brother, Sammy, who's at uh, Google Research. Um, since there are a lot of people interested in um, actual language processing here, I thought I, I would uh, say a few words about some of the things um, I've contributed to that's connected to deep learning, but that came before. And that is the idea of learning representations for individual words as part of a language model. So I actually came 
appeared at Johns Hopkins about 10 years ago to talk exactly about this. And um, so in those days, what it was about was learning to predict the next word and the sequence of words given the previous words, uh, using a very straightforward neural net, with uh, the only kink being that the first layer of the neural net is, is just mapping the word symbols into these vectors, uh, one vector per word. So it's just looking up at a table and using the same table for all the words at different positions. And otherwise, it's just trained as a regular neural net. Um, and why we were uh, interested in this, because I thought that there was something wrong with n-grams and other uh, non-parametric methods for both language modeling and general for machine learning, uh, in that these kinds of uh, non-parametric methods wouldn't generalize to new configurations uh, naturally. Uh, whereas what happens here is that uh, if you, once you map the words to this uh, distributed representation, uh, uh, what happens is it will automatically generalize what it has learned for configurations of words to other configurations of words that have similar representations. And, and in this way, there's a kind of chicken and egg thing happening where uh, the representations of words that come up in this similar context will end up being similar, uh, so long as they help you predict the next word um, uh, properly. And you get uh, uh, potentially exponentially more powerful neuralization, and I, I don't have time to talk about it here, but I've written a few papers about how distributed representations in general can, in theory, bring you an exponential advantage in terms of the uh, uh, number of parameters you need to represent uh, a, a complicated function. So uh, I guess many of you have seen these. You can take the, these, these uh, high dimensional vectors, well, like a few hundred dimensional vectors, and, and and uh, reduce their dimension to two so you can visualize them. And then you, you zoom in and you see that the words uh, you know, aggregate uh, in each other in a semantically meaningful way. So here uh, there's a cluster of words about countries. And, and you, can, you can spend hours looking at these things and they're fun. Uh, here you see uh, verbs and uh, conjugations of uh, to be and things like that. But something really cool came up recently that some of you know about that I want to mention that has to do with uh, learning of these embeddings. And that's uh, essentially coming from the work of Thomas Mikulov, uh, first when he was at uh, Microsoft and then at Google, uh, where he's noted as a kind of uh, unexpected side effect that these word embedding, these word vectors, uh, had some uh, kind of analogical properties. So, if you take the representation for Paris and Rome and France and Italy, and, and, and you look at them, you see that the vector going from Paris to Rome is aligned with the vector going from Rome to Italy. And so now you can do things like Paris minus France plus Italy, and it gives you something pretty close to the vector for Rome. Similarly, if you do king minus queen, it's about the same as math minus one. So what, what, why is this interesting? It's because you, you, you are uh, when you take difference of vectors, you're getting something more abstract, which is allows you to reason by analogy. Now, you can train machine learning systems to, to do these kinds of things, but the really amazing things here, here is that this was not uh, achieved through supervised learning of, of analogies. This was achieved by just doing language modeling in a complete, completely unsupervised way. And that's really surprising. And that's, that's uh, something we need to understand better, why it's happening and and how to generalize this. Um, one of the issues we faced initially with the, the, the kind of uh, uh, neural net language model uh, learns embeddings is that the output of the neural net is huge. It has as many uh, output units as the number of words in the vocabulary. So in the, the experiments I run, uh, I was limiting myself to something like 10,000. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, for real language models, you wanted at least 100,000, and Google wants you know millions. Um, so there are a bunch of techniques over the years that people have looked at to try to reduce that computational bottleneck. Uh, when I actually came uh, here at Johns Hopkins, I presented uh, this idea, um, and then we implemented it in the paper that came out in AI Stats a couple of years later where you uh, organize the, the word into some kind of hierarchy, uh, a tree structure, and then instead of predicting the words directly, you predict the, 
the, the, the pattern structure. So you predict um, which word class the word belongs and within the class uh, which word it is. And each of these predictions is, is, is small. And so if, if you have two levels and you're organizing well, then the number of, of uh, children you have to look at is only an order of square root of the number and size of the vocabulary. And if you do it uh, on a binary tree, you can go down to log n. So it's a pretty drastic reduction in computation. And this is actually how current state-of-the-art models using a neural natural language model are doing it. Um, and uh, there are other methods that we played around over the years and other people looked at uh, where you use sampling methods in order to reduce the computational burden. So instead of uh, trying to, uh, when you train these nets, what, what are you trying to do? You're trying to <coughs> make the output of the correct word uh, larger and make the output of the other word smaller. So you always want to, clearly you want to maximize the output of the correct one, but maybe you don't need to visit all the other ones for every, every example. You can sample negative examples. And that's essentially what all of these methods do. Uh, and uh, you can use important sampling tricks. Uh, you can also use um, some in uniform sampling um, uh, in a family of criteria called uh, stochastic contrastive criteria. Basically trying to, to um, push up the correct answer and push down a randomly chosen uh, incorrect answer. And even though we... Um, so this uh, doesn't allow you to uh, get a, an estimator of the probability, but um, it still works, so it gives you very good embeddings. And it still gives you, if you wanted to do uh, something like uh, classification or whatever, this still works. So it, it doesn't learn a, a probabilistic model of the sequence of words in a way that we can interpret it easily, but, but it does work in the sense of learning good representations. Um, and in some cases, that's all you need. And the importance of the Yeah, these, these give you proper estimators of probabilities. Yeah. But this is so much simpler. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to depth. Um, so this is one of the things that I would say makes a difference between what we did in the uh, when I did my PhD in, in the late 80s and early 90s, and what we have been doing in the last uh, 10 years now is trying to uh, find better ways of training deeper neural nets, um, both supervised and unsupervised, and both discriminative and generative. And um, there's a lot that's been written already, and there's probably a lot more to be done uh, on the theory side to understand why having these multiple levels of representation could be useful. And um, the basic idea is that uh, you can think of it like uh, factoring a polynomial. So you can represent a, a polynomial as a sum of products, and it could be a uh, a very, very long polynomial with many, many terms. But maybe you can factor this polynomial into something that's uh, much simpler to write down. And if you can do that, then uh, you need much fewer parameters in order to train it. And that's what deep learning is about. It's trying to find a kind of factorization of the function you want to learn into this uh, a composition of function of simpler functions. So if you can learn a composition, and it turns out that your composition of, fun of simpler function uh, fits well your data, then it's more likely to generalize better. Um, simply because with you know a, a kind of simpler structure, you're able to explain more, even though the final function could be very complicated. I mean, it may look complicated, just like you take uh, a, a product of polynomials and you multiply them, it ends up being a huge polynomial. Uh, it can have a huge number of, of ups and downs as a function. So the number of variations that it can capture can be exponentially large with the depth, yet the number of parameters can remain small. Whereas if you have a shallow architecture, you basically need uh, as many hidden units or as many RBF units if you're doing an SVM as you uh, have variations or ups and downs in your function. Okay. Then there's, of course, uh, the biological motivation, uh, especially when we know about the, the uh, visual cortex clearly suggests that the brain is using this kind of composition of, uh, of nonlinear transformations and nonlinear uh, relationships. Uh, there's also similar kind of arguments that can be made by looking at uh, how we think from a cognitive point of view. Um, more recently, and I'll say a few more words about that later, there is a motivation 
from the point of view of um, uh, sampling methods for generative models. So it turns out that sampling in, in general probabilistic models is, is difficult, and uh, the most general methods based on MCMC uh, can in principle do everything, but they can be uh, arbitrarily bad, arbitrarily uh, high variance. And um, as I say, as I mentioned later, if you, if, you, if you sample at the higher levels of representation, you can actually, again, these methods to work a lot better in the sense of better mix. And of course, the real reason why uh, people got so excited is because they found that it worked so well. And we can find a bunch of things, most notably object recognition and speech recognition, but also language and, and music model. And the press has been picking up on that, and uh, I guess this slide is already getting old. And it's more, uh, I'm not going to bore you with that. And the uh, MIT Technology Review uh, last year decided to put deep learning as one of the pain breakthrough technologies of 2013. I mean, they were late by six years, but that's okay. Um, so some of you, I'm sure a lot of you know about uh, how speech recognition has been uh, influenced, uh, changed by the advent of uh, deep learning, but this, I find this, this graph really amazing. Uh, so these are years, and this, these, uh, the y-axis is word error rate on switchboard. Um, and what happened in the 90s is that we made a lot of progress, both due to better algorithms. Uh, I mean, it was always GMM and HMMs, but uh, essentially being able to train bigger models faster and so on. And then in the next decade, even though computational power continued to increase, uh, models continued to be bigger, uh, there wasn't so much progress. And then deep learning came. So that makes people pay attention. Yosha, why do you think there wasn't progress during these two years? Well, I was busy doing something else. <laughs> 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 Um, I think so. When I when I did when I finished my PhD and uh, I considered what I would do next, I thought uh, speech recognition the speech recognition area was going into kind of a local minimum where people were just doing very small tweaks, and I, I, I wanted to do something uh, a bit more uh, risky and ambitious. And I think that's a general problem in many areas of. Uh, science, especially uh, engineering-like sciences, where we can get stuck in uh, in an area of the space of algorithms. And so we have to take risks at some point and try things we don't, which don't work in, uh, initially. Um, so that's... So, so I'm not sure that slide is entirely accurate. It sounds like a Microsoft view yeah, that, that's, of the that's, 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 those numbers come from Microsoft. Oh, they oh, blame, oh, blame oh, them. You know what the big trick they did is? They started testing on a different subset from what people have been testing before. Oh. So it really is not more than like 10 or 20 percent relative improvement. So I, <laughs> I I wouldn't show that slide again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there has been improvement, but it's nothing like that. Okay. <laughs> well, it depends on which data set you test, of course, right? No, but it's, uh, look, I, this, I don't know where these numbers come from, but the reality is there's like 20%. Maybe, maybe 25% of Okay. It's real, but it's, it's not like that. Well, <laughs> thanks for the information. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm more certain about these numbers. And that's in computer vision, optical recognition. Uh, so there was another breakthrough that uh, happened uh, a couple of years later than the speech recognition breakthrough. And uh, there's an interesting story uh, here with people in the computer vision community telling uh, Jeff Hinton and Yang Lukarn that uh, they, they would believe deep learning if they could make this uh, make a breakthrough in, in uh, a large uh, object recognition task like the ImageNet competition, and so they did, and uh, brought the error rate by <coughs> down by almost half. If you, the current numbers are, I think, around twelve percent. So it, it's now down by more than half uh, using um, a convolutional deep net 
uh, with all kinds of variations that are now become standard and that many of them are actually used also in speech. This has been uh, picked up by, uh, of course, uh, companies like Google and Baidu in their products. Um, just want to mention a much uh, smaller uh, feat that uh, my students achieved uh, just recently, a few weeks ago. Uh, we won a competition, uh, computer vision competition, <coughs> where you had to go from videos of uh, uh, clips from movies where you see the face of an actor into classifying the emotion, the expression on the face of the person. And, um, and uh, we were able to win by a reasonable margin over the, uh, the other techniques. Actually, one of them was also using uh, deep net. Um, there's a more interesting question that's uh, actually now starting to move towards the, the theme um, of unsupervised learning, which is how do humans generalize from very few examples? How do they manage to do that? It's amazing. Um, um, I show you just one or two examples of a new category, and, and we can generalize quite well. And of course, all of the machine learning we know, including the nets, you know, they're pretty bad at that. Um, and so the, the the only reasonable answer is because they're exploiting all of the other learning that's been done before um, to build some kind of representation of uh, how the world works, so that. It, it, it's almost like if this new example, you're not doing any learning, you're just doing inference, right? Based on that new piece of evidence, you, you, can, you can guess all kinds of properties that were missing for that example. And that's just uh, almost a, as there's no learning. So it relies completely on all the past learning, and I think it relies on learning abstract representations and to, to, to obtain abstract representations, you, I think you need uh, some kind of depth, multiple level of and uh, I also believe that somehow these representations, either explicitly or implicitly, must capture the explanatory factors. That's what makes it easy to generalize. Um, if you understand completely the scene, then um, some new configuration is going to be easy to explain as well. All right. um, so uh, moving in that direction, a few years ago, we, we tried to use these uh, unsupervised pre-training trick, which has been sort of this starting uh, approach to deep learning, where we train deep nets by unsupervised learning of, uh, of uh, like RDNs and, and, and the noisy memory encoders, uh, in two competitions of two transfer learning competitions, where uh, you have training data, of, uh, including uh, examples of uh, some classes, but the test data really has new classes you've never seen, and your job is to come up with representations for the test examples such that very simple. Linear classifier trained on like one, two, four, eight examples uh, is going to be doing a good job. So on this graph, this is the log of the number of uh, labeled examples on the test set that are used to test your representation. So one, two, four, these are on log scale. And the y-axis is a, some measure of accuracy, so one is 100% accuracy. And these curves show one data set where the, the effect of depth is amazing. And uh, this is if you put your classifier directly on the raw data. This is if you put your classifier, so you'd like the curve to be like this one, uh, to, to rise up as quickly as possible. Uh, if, you, if you put it on the first layer, which is trained completely and supervised, and then the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one. So, so somehow by, by, by learning these deep representations, in this case, the, the effect on your ability to generalize from fewer examples is, is absolutely uh, amazing. So, so if I can read those uh, axes, yes. uh, on the one on the right, uh, for one example, you are at 85% performance, uh, yeah. two, uh, um, after two, after, after, so this is, this is log scale, so this is one labeled examples per class, yep. this is two per class, yep. right. so here you've got, say, four examples, and you're getting, uh, whatever, 95% uh, uh, accuracy, essentially. How different were the so the interesting thing about this competition is that we didn't know what the data was. So the data had been obfuscated, so no one could use their own human prior knowledge in order to cheat into something, some good representation. The idea was, can someone come up with a completely ad initio learning of representation uh, 
and that's what we evaluated rather than, you know, the way we usually do things in machine learning is we have, you know, lots of students and engineers coming up with good features, and that's what, you know, is competing really and not the machine learning. But so, do you still have a sense of what the classes are? Yeah, so, so, so there, uh, there were five data sets, for example, in this one, uh, some text, some video, some image. Uh, uh, this one, I think, is uh, features coming of uh, looking at uh, satellite uh, data and trying to classify into the types of trees and stuff like that. Now, there is um, an interesting question that is, what is a good representation? I mean, if we're going to be learning representations, what makes a good representation? Of course, we could say, well, we, if we use a representation in a classifier and it does well, okay, that's, that's an easy answer. But is there a more fundamental question uh, we could try to answer there? Um, there is something some related to this question, which is a very important notion in uh, computer vision, and maybe to some extent in speech recognition, which is how do we design features that are invariant to the things that don't matter. Uh, like, I would say, in speech, that would be uh, maybe the microphone characteristics or the speaker. Uh, but really, if you're doing unsupervised learning, nobody tells you what variations matter and what variations don't. So, what can you do? <coughs> in that case, you don't really want to do invariant learning, because it doesn't even make sense. Uh, you don't know which variations matter. Like, you don't know if you're going to be using those features for speech recognition or for speaker uh, uh, identification. So you shouldn't throw away that information. You should just keep it, but somehow separate the um, characteristics of the signal that tell you about the speaker from the characteristics of the signal that tell you about the phonemes. That's what you really want. And you want to do that, to do that automatically without having to tell the machine. Um, so that's what I call disentangling factors of variation. Um, and I don't know how to do that, but that's what I would really like to have. Machine learning that discovers the underlying factors and separates them out. And maybe it's not going to do a perfect job because it doesn't know what the true factors are, but maybe there's something in the statistics of the data that uh, gives you strong indications of what these factors are, and they have some kind of orthogonality or independence that you can exploit. Um, it turns out that when we use our classical techniques like RDMs and, and, and autoencoders, uh, some amount of disentangling is happening. In other words, that if you know that uh, some about some factors and you look for them in the features, you find some features more correlated to some factors and less correlated to other factors as you go higher up. So some kind of disentangling is going on, but we don't fully understand. And my thinking is that we want people to do this really well uh, in general in a completely uh, ab initio way. We, we need some kind of priors to help the machine figure out uh, you know, what disentangling even means. So one, um, so I've listed here a bunch of these priors. Uh, one is that there are such factors, right? that they exist and somehow they can vary separately. Um, another one is that they, they organize themselves at multiple levels in a kind of hierarchy. Another one is that uh, if you have classes, uh, then those classes, uh, the identity of those classes uh, is one of the factors explaining the data. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the assumption that you're making in some supervised learning. Um, for example, you could have, what I'm saying is, you could have P of X and Y being decomposed as P of Y given X times P of X, where P of X has nothing to do with Y. In which case, you couldn't do semi-supervised learning. The only reason you're able to do semi-supervised learning is because uh, P of X contains information about Y. That, for example, there are natural clusters, and so if you can identify these clusters, then it becomes easier to classify. Uh, this prior tells you that if you have different tasks, that they share some factors, that some subset of factors is useful for some task, and another subset is useful for another task. So this is, this is the prior we use in multitask learning. Another prior is the one and, uh, we find in the manifold hypothesis, which tells us that in the kinds of data we care about, probability is concentrated. That most configurations are unlikely, and probability is concentrated in these 
typically low dimensional regions. Uh, connected to this hypothesis is the natural clustering hypothesis that tells us that, well, these regions of concentration uh, can be interpreted as classes, and uh, they, you know, we can call them manifolds, and these manifolds are well separated by regions of low probability. Um, another uh, interesting prior is the temporal and spatial coherence prior, which has been uh, exploited for a long time, as well as a long history behind this. Um, for example, all the work on slow features, um, and um, it's, it's exploited in, for example, convolutional nets because of spatial coherence, and in many guises this comes up. Sparsity is one of the priors that people in the uh, deep learning community have kind of uh, hit on, uh, and that's interesting. And you can interpret it from a, 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 as a prior by saying that most factors, for a particular example, most factors are irrelevant. <coughs> so if I give you an image, it doesn't contain, it's an image that's outdoor, so it doesn't contain indoor things. And so a lot of the concepts that matter for indoor things don't matter there. Um, and then there's uh, an interesting prior here, uh, which hasn't been uh, discussed as much, and uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense, which is that in a good representation, the distribution of the factors should be simple. So the extreme case is that the factors are independent of each other, but you could have something not as drastic. Uh, for example, you can ha imagine having just linear dependencies between the factors. And that's what the, the Mikulov example is actually exploiting. The way he's training these is that he's looking for linear dependencies between the embeddings of successive words. And I believe by, that by doing that, he's, he's kind of regularizing in some, in some way and, and uh, getting these nice uh, analogies coming up more easily. All right, uh, see that is flying. So let's, uh, let's go to unsupervised learning. Um, so unsupervised learning would be great. I mean, uh, we can exploit uh, more unlabeled data. I think it's really important for transfer learning, uh, for answering new questions, and not just always the same old question, um, for structured output problems. But it hasn't, I, I don't see Google using this right now. I don't see Microsoft using this. So why is that? Um, so I think there are some fundamental problems that make unsupervised learning, especially of probabilistic models, uh, really hard. And um, here I'm trying to explain them. One is the problem of mixing between modes when you're running, a, 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 when you're trying to sample using a Markov chain. And the reason it's hard, it has to do with the manifold hypothesis that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to go into more detail on that. And the other is that the number of these modes, so the modes are the regions of high probability that I was talking about before. Uh, if there's a huge number of them, then uh, either in the posterior or the joint distribution we care about, then, then modeling these distributions, these joint or these conditional distributions could be really uh, hard. And again, the, the sampling methods are going to fail. So let's look at the first problem. Um, so this is meant to be a, a distribution over here, a one-dimensional space, but think really a high-dimensional space. And these are the modes, okay, these regions, uh, those peaks of probability those regions of hyperbolicity. And uh, MCMC uh, operates by moving around in that space, by making small steps. And the problem of the, is that it only goes from a, uh, it only wants to go to a probable configuration. That's what MCMC does. It wants to stay in the regions of high probability. I mean, if you start it in the low probability region, it will move towards the high probability region, and then it will stay there. And it will be very hard for, for MCMC methods to cross the desert of low probability, because it would be exponentially uh, unlikely to do all of these unlikely moves one after the other. So um, that's bad, and it's particularly bad if you use these MCMC methods in the middle of your training procedures. It turns out that for many of our unsupervised learning procedures with holistic models, like Boltzmann machines, that's what you're doing. Uh, initially, when you train a probabilistic model, uh, it doesn't know anything, so it says, I'm, I'm happy with everything, everything is probable, I like your uniform distribution and it's kind of flat, and then you can mix easily, you can move around, and as it, tr uh, as it learns, it starts putting you know, uh, more uh, concentrated prob probability in a few places. It still mixes fairly well. So initial training of uh, RVNs and stuff like that works quite well. But then, as it gets good, it has to put low probability in, in more and more places, 
And that's where it gets harder to train, because now the, this, these MCMC methods we're using to get a gradient, uh, <coughs> well, uh, they, they give us a very uh, noisy estimate of the gradient. And so I think training stalls. So let me tell you about uh, something related that uh, may help us to fix this problem. Uh, so we, we looked at, we tried to do some kind of visualization to understand what is going on with those representations we are learning with uh, stacks of RVMs or stacks of uh, denoising with one quarters uh, or contracted with one quarters, whatever. And what we find is that uh, the, the, the space uh, is kind of distorted by, uh, by these representations. The, the, the shape of the distributions in input space is very, very different from the shape of the distributions when you take the data and you move it up to these high-level representations. And so this slide is supposed to illustrate that. Uh, let's look at the top here. So here, I'm showing uh, in input space, so this is pixel space, say, uh, images of 9 and images of 3. This is just a cartoon, of course. Uh, the, the distributions are very concentrated, and uh, there's a lot of empty void, and it's hard to mix between them. And it looks like when you project the data onto the hidden units higher up, you see the distributions now uh, where the data is occupy a lot more volume, and those things get closer to each other. And furthermore, uh, uh, it's like if those manifolds where the data is lying are have become flat. So let me explain what I mean. So in input space, it's like the regions uh, of high probability; these manifolds are highly curved, highly much more than that picture. They really have a lot of curvature. It's just you know wiggling all over the place. Uh, so if you take any two examples, think about two images like the 9 and the 3 here, and you do a linear interpolation, and you look at the image in between, you get something that's unlikely. Right? To just add two images, you get garbage, right? It doesn't look like a real image. In fact, you know that it's a mixture of two images. Whereas if you do the same thing in the space uh, of the learned representations, the image in between looks like a likely image. So here if we take this three and this nine, and we move it up to the higher level representation, and then we add them up uh, with different coefficients, we get all of these images which all look like you know, fairly plausible digits. So what it means is that although in input space the, the, the manifolds are highly curved, in the higher level space it's like you know, this curve is like a straight line when you move in, in the representation space. And, uh, and that's great. That's great because now uh, you can, it's much easier to do all kinds of things when, when, uh, to, to mix in particular when you are um, working at that level. Um, let me say a few words about the other problem of having... Yes? Before you go, could you spend a minute telling me, for example, for like interpolated representation, how do you synthesize the image? I mean, I can imagine what it might yes. be, but I'd like to Yes, it. okay, sorry, I should have been more precise. Yeah. So you take your image, yeah. you move it, you, you compute its representation. Now you have two images, you have the representation. Now you can mix them at that level, like just do linear interpolation. And now you've got these vectors that are just abstract vectors. And you can use the decoder, I mean, you can use the, uh, the decoder to map them back, or the generative model to map them back in input space. You've got an auto encoder, right? So you've got a mapping from x to h and a mapping from h to x. Okay, so you keep the mapping from h Oh yes, to you need both mappings for this to work. You need the encoder to go from input space to representation space, and you need a decoder to go from representation space to input space. And then you can visualize the interpolated points in representation space as images that make sense to you. And here in the representation space, you're looking at the highest layer? Yes. Actually, you can see this is uh, first layer, second layer, right. The higher you go, the better it is. And I suppose the other way to do it, if you didn't have the decoder, would be to sort of start playing with the input till you get Yeah, you could do that. You could do that, but it's so much more convenient to have a decoder. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I ask, can I ask one yeah. So, the thing I can have is or right? Yes, yes, so yes. Right? So the Except they do it wrong. But well, yeah. so, so that's the question: is, is what, why, what about the neural net architecture? Yes. Do you think 
because right. you know it's supplanting this notion of local graph structure and there's right. So the training criterion for things like the bat and eigenmaps and other uh, manifold learning methods is is fine. It's not the problem. It's the parameterization. The parameterization is this uh, basically you know a sum of Gaussian. It's 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 it's, it's a dumb uh, non-parametric model. Uh, and what it does is that it doesn't generalize. It only generalizes very locally. So in other words, to capture the structure of a highly curved manifold, you need to use this. If you have a highly curved manifold, you need enough examples to cover all of the curvatures, all the all, all of the uh, uh, curves of, of the manifold. And and if you don't have examples, you know enough to cover all these variations, you're 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 going to do something completely wrong. Whereas with these neural nets, you have a chance if there is some structure in the data and your model can you know can be trained to capture it to actually generalize to uh, new places you haven't seen. And we verified that it works. For example, you can train on some digits and then generalize to other, other digits it's never seen in the sense that it, it knows the shape of the manifold in, uh, in new places. So uh, and, and the reason it can do that is because it's assuming that there are these underlying factors that are kind can, can vary independently. And uh, if there is such a thing, and there is in many data sets, then it can generalize to completely new configurations of these factors that it has never seen before. So how do you impose sort of locality that affect the nearest number of Oh, you get locality automatically for almost any machine learning method because it likes uh, you know, smooth, continuous things. So that gives you locality for free. And the reason it likes smooth, continuous things is that they're easier to learn. Right? So when the weights are small, you get smooth functions. OK, but so there's a regularizer. Yeah, there's a regularizer. In almost any machine learning you know you, you want to do, uh, you end up having a kind of smoothness regularizer, implicit or explicit. Here, it, it's just the magnitude of the weights which give you this regularizer explicitly. More questions on this picture? Which you like? <laughs> All right. Um, so let me move on to something else. So I mentioned there was another challenge, which is that you potentially you could have a lot of modes in your distribution. And um, um, yeah, let me just skip quickly. Um, so, so here again, it's a cartoon. But imagine your distribution have you know many many modes. That's p of x. And uh, this is going to be a problem uh, when you sample, and it's going to be a problem when you learn, because uh, especially when you sample, because. Uh, uh, or when you train, it's it's going to be hard to um, uh, it's going to be hard to generalize to new modes. It's going to be hard to uh, uh, avoid the spurious modes. It's going to be hard to to even mix between all those modes when you're training. So instead, we consider a slightly different problem, which is uh, the problem of uh, learning a markup chain that uh, whose stationary distribution would be the same that you're looking for. So you're looking for some distribution, trying to estimate a distribution. But instead of representing uh, P of x directly, we, we, I'm saying, well, why not representing the distribution implicitly through some uh, conditional transition operator that tells you how to move from one point to another point. Now, the advantage of this in terms of uh, dealing with the modes is that this conditional distribution uh, only needs to look at uh, few modes. So in particular, the, uh, the normalizing constant of the probability distribution, the partition function, which comes up in the gradient, uh, has to consider uh, all the modes. Uh, but if it's a conditional distribution, the, the normalizing constant is only over the, the modes that, or the, the higher probability regions that matter in the context of the right-hand side. So if I'm going to move from a point to uh, some neighboring point, then the conditional distribution here might only have two major modes, and the other are uh, kind of negligible. And so getting the partition function for this conditional distribution right is going to be much easier. The, either I can even do it analytically, or I, I can do some MCMC or something, but it, it's, the MCMC is going to be much easier because it's going to have to only visit a few modes before I get my gradients to be right. Whereas if I try to learn P of x directly, the gradient 
uh, of the log likelihood involves summing through all the modes. And uh, that's going to be just much harder. So, so that's, the, that's the idea of uh, what I call uh, generative stochastic networks, where instead of, uh, of parameterizing P of X, we're parameterizing this transition operator. And uh, the more general way of seeing it is we, we, have a, we also introduce some latent variables in the Markov chain. So now we have got a Markov chain over some visible variables and hidden variables. And uh, just like we would have in, in many graphical models. But the difference is the parameterization is now the parameterization of the Markov chain transition itself. So in this case, I have a parameterization that tells me how to get a new x from the previous h, and how to get a new h from the previous h and the previous x. And, and if I just sample from these, I, I can run my chain. So given the parameters, I can sample from the model by running my chain. Now, the question is, how do we learn the parameters of these uh, distributions so that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the samples I'm getting on the visibles are of roughly the right distribution? And, um, oh, and w one trick we use here, which is use useful in practice and has been picked up recently, is that notice how I've decided to parameterize this one, P of H, given the previous one, as a deterministic function of uh, the uh, conditioning variables and some independent noise source. And the advantage of that is uh, that you can just do backdrop when you compute gradients. Anyway, I'll come back to that later. Uh, so the, the answer to my question, how do we train that? It turns out that there, there's a way to train which, um, which works, which is you, you take an example, you throw it into the Markov chain, and then you change your parameters so that it produces, again, the example with high probability. So if you take uh, a data example, you put it here, and then you just you know, let it run a little bit, and then ask this guy to reproduce the original one, uh, that will make the parameters of the, this traditional operator uh, learn uh, to generate data like the, the training data. And uh, I'm, um, yeah, I could spend a lot more time to explain that, but um, mm -hmm. let me move on. So you can do this to to you can use this to deal with missing inputs, uh, structured outputs. Uh, basically, you look at subsets and predict the rest and stuff like that. We've done some experiments. Um, on rather simple data sets like MNIST and these uh, images of faces, where we can see that it generates sort of nicely comparable to state-of-the-art learning models for the data sets. And you can also do things like filling in some parts, like here I've got a, a, an image of a digit, but I'm going to clamp the right-hand side and let the uh, left-hand side be free, uh, initialize it with random noise, and then let the Markov chain run. But this is a conditional Markov chain where I only resample the left-hand side. And you can see it converges very, very quickly. The burden is, is almost immediate. And uh, if there is some ambiguity, like if there's an example here, uh, that could be a 3, or maybe it could be an 8. And so it will, the Markov chain will alternate between 3s and 8s. And this is just the Markov chain free running. So it resamples all of the pixels each time. And it will, uh, this is one sample after the other, so it's, it's really mixing pretty fast. Sorry, sorry, the lower half is wrapping around, so we can see yes. how it goes in. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looks like it's wrapping. Yeah, it is wrapping around, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's one long sequence here. Um, so you can use this framework to uh, actually explain a few nice things. And in particular, some of you may have heard of dependency nets. So dependency nets were invented by Heckerman and collaborators uh, as a, a way to train uh, base nets uh, that would be much simpler than the usual ways. And the way you would do it is you would train a separate model, maybe like a neural net, that predicts each variable given the other one. So this isn't the case where everything is observed. And, uh, but, but still, learning the joint might be complicated because of the structure of the net. It, it may have uh, like. Uh, um, very large tweaks, so usual training methods are kind of difficult. But that's easy, right? It's just like uh, any machine learning method that predicts one variable given other variables. 
Um, but they, they didn't have, uh, uh, it wasn't clear uh, from their paper and the subsequent work, uh, what, what is it you're really learning here in the sense of, can you actually interpret this? What is the model that is actually being learned? Because these conditionals, unfortunately, are not guaranteed to be consistent with a unique joint distribution. So it turns out you can, you can frame this as a special, as a GSN in a particular form by saying, okay, so actually this thing is a building block for a markup chain, which is a Gibbs type of markup chain. And, uh, and uh, the theorems we have tell us that uh, if, as, you, as you do a better job of training this, your uh, spatial distribution of the markup chain is converging to something that estimates the data distribution. And so, um, so, so now you tell me, well, okay, but still, where is this unique joint? Well, actually, if you look carefully, what this joint is, is a kind of mixture of all the possible orders in which you could visit the, the variables to, to decide which you resample. And in fact, uh, the sampling scheme that they were using doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it doesn't satisfy the ergodicity characteristic. So they were proposing to iterate one variable at a time in a fixed order, but you actually have to do it in a random order in order to guarantee ergodicity. And then you can show that uh, this, this way of training, which is just um, kind of a pseudo likelihood, uh, gives rise to a markup chain that uh, estimates the true uh, data generating distribution. Um, in general, if you, if you have a way to train models that estimate the probability, the joint probability of some subset given the rest, then you can you can usually basically uh, extend this and um, and essentially uh, obtain markup chains that use these condition probabilities to resample subsets each time. And I'm going to tell you about a particular model that we worked on called NPDDN, which is uh, derived from the both machine, and NP stands for multi prediction, and uh, these are samples from the model. But let me uh, go to the next slide to explain this. Um, so, so in a deep Boltzmann machine, I realize many of you don't know what a deep Boltzmann machine is, but it's uh, it's just a big Boltzmann machine, and the Boltzmann machine just has a bunch of stochastic units connected to each other, um, and there's a, 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 a various markup chains you can define to sample from it. The, the most uh, traditional is a Gibbs sampling, where you resample one variable or a subset of variables at a time. But um, what we're doing here is slightly different. We're taking the, the energy function of the deep Boltzmann machine and we're training it with a generalized pseudo likelihood, meaning just what I was talking about, that you're going to predict uh, on some subset of variables like these two guys or uh, this guy, or actually the y here, that we're trying to learn the joint of uh, input image and uh, label. Um, so you predict a subset given the rest. And you know, an interesting subset is, is y given x, but there are all the other subsets that, that could be there. And, uh, and you, uh, instead of using uh, Gibbs sampling to predict, which would involve averaging over many uh, runs, we use mean field. So it's just basically like a big recurrent network in which each unit that gets updated deterministically based on the layer above and the layer below, and you recurse that many times, and then you just read off probabilities for each of the variables after a number of a fixed number of steps, and you try to make these probabilities uh, uh, high or low uh, to maximize the probability of the correct uh, values of these variables. So again, you can interpret that as a uh, GSN, just like it's just very similar to the um, dependency in that case. Um, the interesting thing is, well, you can now use this for classification, of course, and we can get very good uh, performance with that. Um, so we get something like 0.88% uh, error on MNIST, uh, which compares to uh, previous work on D-Bolt machine, where you get 10 point, no, sorry, uh, where is the, oh, 0.95%, right. Um, but the, the, the more interesting thing is that if you, if you take the deep Boltzmann machine, if you, if you believe the deep Boltzmann machine story and you sample from the deep Boltzmann machine trained in this way, you get garbage samples. And in many cases, when you train graphical models, 
with the wrong criterion, which is not nice and likely to get this ugly new sample from the model, it doesn't always work nicely. This is what happens here. So this, this pseudo likelihood training just doesn't work as a, a way to train a, a good generative model. But if you interpret this as a GSM, you sample by this markup chain, then you get nice samples. So it's just that you, you have to match your training criterion with what is the underlying generative model you're really learning, and then you get things right. Okay, um, let's skip this. Um, I mentioned this nice trick uh, which uh, we came up with uh, in two of recent papers, including the GSM paper, where you take um, latent variables that are continuous and you reparameterize them uh, as deterministic functions of um, the other variables that you, know, you care about and some independent noise source. So once you've done that, you can rewrite marginalization. So let's say I want to predict p of y given x. I have to integrate a role of these h's. And so this is just a, you know, my marginalization. I have to sample p of h given x and average p of y given h and x. Uh, instead of doing that, you could rewrite it as sample this independent noise source and then uh, just have p of y given this deterministic function, uh, which could mean h. And now this whole thing is something I can compute derivatives of and basically backprop through this into the computation of h. So uh, if I look at this derivative, for example, it just means sample my noise sources and then just do backprop on the max on the likelihood. That's very, very easy. It says take your noise sources, generate your noise, that will give you values of the, of the latent variables, and just do backdrop into your, your, your model of the likelihood, which now is something you can compute. Uh, whereas if you had the kind of sampling view of things, it wasn't obvious you could do that, but you can. Do you think of this as analogous to important sampling? Uh, no, no. You could also do important sampling on top of that, but it, that's more like how you can backdrop into, so for example, the way we trained this big thing here, is we have a target for this. We want to maximize the likelihood of uh, some, somehow the correct answer here. We just backdrop through this as a big recurrent net that has noise injected in it everywhere. And so you can, yeah, you, just, you don't need to marginalize explicitly. The only thing is you, you sample your noise. And that gives you now a kind of deterministic computation from input to output. And this is like a big denoising with one quarter, by the way. Uh, and you just backdrop through the whole thing in order to train. So that's much easier to train. It's really not clear to me how, how, how this works, like for real data. So how does it generate a particular data in a particular noise? Oh, no, the noise is, is, is blind. It's like Gaussian or you know, setting some bits to zero. It's like in denoising of encoders. The noise actually has to be as, as uh, generic as possible. Yeah, you don't want specific noise. You don't want, uh, yeah, I think I've taken enough time now. And, um, just to conclude, um, um, deep learning has, has matured from the early years, uh, 2005, 2006, when we started this. Uh, lots of industrial applications, as you know, but I think there's lots of really exciting challenges ahead of us. Um, one question is, how do we really learn better abstract representations? Uh, and that's, I think, it's going to be very important to deal with the cases where you, generalization is difficult. When you want to generalize to new classes, new domains, uh, non stationary situations, uh, um, and so on. And um, the other aspect of my presentation was when, when you want to do supervised learning and many um, probabilistic and motivated approaches, you, you end up having to deal with uh, these intractable sums. And there are many approaches that have been proposed, and um, I'm suggesting that maybe we can. Uh, reframe the way we do things uh, where we learn directly to generate the data rather than learn a probabilistic model that has you know an analytic formulation for P of X. Alright, and I want to thank uh, a lot of people from my lab who have contributed to this work. So while well, we have to be out of the room in, uh, in 10 minutes, uh, we do have uh, some time for questions uh, for people who can stay, which is probably most people. I think we have any classes, so we'll record it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
height certainly is uh, a dramatic improvement um, from what seemed to be um, uh, in the previous uh, era prior to what you're talking about yes. today. Um, not particularly new ideas, let's say. Um, and I wonder whether the following kind of uh, question has also seen in that improvement, which is uh, understanding of why the networks do uh, as well as they do and why they fail or they fail. You can imagine the competition where everyone's yes. given uh, a very successful network. What you have to do is explain why it works. Right. So I just wondered to the extent um, there has been conceptual technical yes. improvement on that. Um, so let me try to answer your question. Of course, I think uh, a lot more needs to be done in the direction that you were talking about, of understanding. One thing we've done is we've run some uh, hypothesis testing experiments to try to understand why this unsupervised pre-training scheme works so well in some cases. And one of the conclusions is that there's a strong regularization effect. You can really show that the pre-training acts as a regularizer and uh, so that's, that's interesting. That's one, that's one part of the story. Um, another part of the story is more connected to the optimization problem, which is, I, I believe, one of the great challenges ahead of us, that, uh, how to better train these beasts. So even if you have infinite amount of data, forget about regularization. Uh, how do we train these models? Well, whether, whether they're generative or they're, they're discriminant. Actually, it's easier if they're discriminant. Uh, there are these, it, it seem, they seem very hard to train, and we can get stuck in what looks like local minima. We don't even know if they are local minima, and, and I, I now believe that they're not local minima, they are saddle points, but that's something that needs to be evaluated. So there's some understanding that's starting to emerge, but it's still a lot of questions. Uh, but it looks like, for example, this uh, exemplified training procedure act as good initializer that give, give you, get you in the right regions where, from which, Initialization is easier, and we now understand that it has to do with, uh, it may have to do at least with uh, just some numerical issues with the gradients being propagated and the eigenvalues of the Jacobians as you go from one layer to the next layer being uh, close to one, being a good condition. So if you think about a node encoder, uh, a good linear node encoder has all its eigenvalues one. It's trying to learn like the identity mapping. And it turns out that this is a very good condition for the gradients to be propagated across many steps. So, um, so I think, uh, so I have a big broad question. So if someone has a short question, they should go first. Okay, I'll go. Um, so one, you know, from a modeler's point of view, or problem solver's point of view, you have, you know, you want to learn representations, you want to learn good models to solve their problem, you have two things you can tweak, right? So one, you can add bias to try to add structure that you think is true in the data or in the domain, and the other is you can change the data, right? Yes. So you can give it more data, less data. Well, the third data. thing, which is you can get a better learning algorithm. You mean an optimization. <laughs> and there's optimization error. Let's assume we have all the possible tools under the sun to solve any optimization problem you want, which is not for practice, but let's assume it exists. Yes, I wish. Yeah. Right, so now my question, Dr. is basically, so um, here, can you speak a little bit to, it seems like, you know, it learns factored representations really well. Uh, in the case where you have static data like objects, you know these are fairly rigid. Uh, you know, these are rigid structures. Yeah. There's variability, but there's variability yeah. of certain kind, yeah. and those kinds of variability can be accomplished using these, uh, you know, factored stack models. But for instance, if you well, we don't know that, but yeah, yeah, we don't know that. Do a it, job. it seems like yeah. it's looking better than it looked yes. maybe five years ago. Yes. But if you look at domains like, say, for instance, activity recognition, and yes. I don't mean activity recognition with the, you know, five gestures, the person-centered, yeah. I mean in complex, really complex mm -hmm. data sets, there's a lot more variability there. And so to some right. extent, there's the data bias, right? So one question is, to what extent can you introduce new kinds of biases? You know, the framework allows you to introduce new kinds of biases easily. And you spoke about this. Um, yes. Yeah, that one. That's right. So I'm really interested in uh, broad priors. Right. Of course, if you have a specific problem to solve, 
you can use the specific knowledge in many possible ways, and you can do all kinds of engineering, and it's great, and it's going to help you solve your particular problem. But what's more exciting is to come up, is to come up with uh, priors or is prior knowledge that you can put in your learning algorithm that's covering a lot of ground that many tasks will you know right. will benefit from, and that's the kind of thing I'm trying to list here. And you know I'm really glad to see more stuff added there. Um, the broader it is, the more you know interesting for AI because I'm really interested in AI and I'm just solving a particular problem. And for AI, you need I mean unless you imagine you have a zillion of these things that are very specific. Uh, and I think that's not what's going on in your brain. You probably have a few tricks that your brain is, is exploiting, a few priors that help it, and that's what we should be looking for. And these priors, it's not just the priors, it's how convenient it will be to put in the learning algorithm itself. So the notion of, how, of learning representations is interesting because many priors can be put in quite naturally there. But yeah, I don't have a general answer besides this kind of stuff. Right, okay. so in the, in the, as long as your problem still involves these priors, it's something that right away is ready to use. But if it involves more than that, then the question is, I guess you'd be building some you know, model on top. Just like you would it's do all, like, um, you know, it's all tinker toy and yeah. I don't know. there's no general recipe. Jason? So, so maybe there's time for one other broad question. Um, so, so the brain is not getting eye ID examples. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that besides the interesting sort of learning theoretical things you could say about non ID data, the real key is to learn representations that uh, will allow you to generalize even though the distribution has changed. And that's where learning good representations becomes important. But we have to adapt the way we learn, we have to uh, uh, handle the sequential aspect and so on. This is all important. But learning good representations in the sense of more extracting more abstract uh, characterization of what's going on, I think is going to be key for doing well in a non IAD setting. I have a question about your recurrent networks and training back, yes. and back in time. Yes. Have, have, how quickly do you use, do you lose strength? How many? How many? How uh, we've made a lot of progress with that. Mm -hmm. So, I worked on this in 1991, and it was, there was a paper in 1994 showing that uh, when you train with backprop through time on very simple problems, after 10 or 20 steps, you're kind of dead. Uh, then came LSTM in the late 90s, and uh, for some of these problems, they were able to train like you know 50 steps, 100 steps, and, uh, um, and we st we still don't have a good understanding of why they work. I think, uh, and now in recent years, there's been a, a few more tricks added to the bag of tricks for training recurrent nets that allow us to, in some cases, to train over hundreds of steps uh, quite well and to generalize over thousands of steps. Now, these are very specific, simple problems, and. Uh, uh, I don't want to make you know too grandiose claims, but there has been progress, and uh, there is interestingly a lot of work, a lot of people looking at this, and I think there will be more progress in the next few years. Do you feel like you have the right kind of computer hardware uh, nowadays uh, for no. these types of problems? <laughs> or is there a, a, a different kind of computer uh, hardware you prefer to have available? Yeah, thousand, ten thousand times faster. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, seriously, we're limited by the computing ability that we have right now. Uh, all of the better models we have, we, you know, we, we know we could get better results if we only we could train a model that's 10 times or 100 times bigger. Uh, so clearly, there's a, a much more pressing need now than ever for specialized hardware. So we've already benefited, we've seen the amazing impact, just a tenfold speed that you get with GPUs on you know, everybody's uh, being impacted like this. Uh, if we can get another tenfold speed up, uh, or a hundredfold speed up, I think uh, the impact on applications could be amazing. Now, what is the right hardware? Um, I don't know, but I have some um, maybe, uh, clues 
I don't think you need 32-bit precision on these weights uh, while you're doing uh, completions of the gradients. You need to store them with high precision, but the gradients themselves can be very noisy. And we see this by the fact that we can train these, these nets where we inject noise all over the place. That means, like dropout and my Gaussian noise, uh, that means you don't need that much precision when you compute the gradients. But, uh, uh, so that means the bulk of the computation could be on low precision uh, somehow, either analog or digital hardware. That, that could give you a speed up. Another kind of speed up uh, is parallelization. Uh, unfortunately, that's harder. Uh, and uh, I have some ideas to do that. But uh, and people at Google are very busy trying to move in that direction. But it's not easy to make those algorithms uh, Paralyzed because the optimization methods are inherently <coughs> sequential. At least those that work well right now. So I, th I think I'd better call time because we're supposed to be out of the room. Uh, so let's thank Joshua again for a nice little talk.